Educating students in rural settings is an important part of public education in America. More than half of all school districts and a third of all public schools are in rural areas. According to the National Center for Education Statistics, over 12 million students attend a rural public elementary or secondary school, accounting for 25% of all public school students. Unrecognized by most Americans and often overshadowed by the nation's attention to dropout challenges in urban settings, more than one-fifth of public schools in rural America have higher than average dropout rates. Because of their remote locations and more limited resources, schools in rural communities often have less access to high-quality technical assistance than schools in other communities. For this reason, the U.S. Department of Education's High School Graduation Initiative Program provided dropout prevention support and technical assistance to grantees and districts across the country. This video highlights dropout prevention efforts in rural districts and schools in Vermont. Vermont is engaged in a major transition to student-centered personalized learning. This historical journey from hallmark legislation, state-sponsored trainings, and local implementation is presented through the voices and stories of state officials, local administrators, educators, and most importantly, students. Uh, Vermont has been working toward the policy environment that we enjoy now, uh, based on both statute and state board rule, that is uh, creating a, uh, an environment in which we're emphasizing personalization, flexibility and proficiency, demonstration of proficiency against standards. Um, so the idea there is that every student will have the opportunity to uh, continue along a personalized pathway to graduation that reflects their interest, their learning needs, um, and the standards that we're asking students to um, address what they are able to know and able to do. The PBL work is coming into play because it encompasses some of the really important things that we have been doing up till now, like formative assessment, and now moving into some directions that are quite new to us, like the proficiency-based learning per se, proficiency-based graduation requirements. So it really will inform our work going forward, but also leveraging the work we've been doing up to this time. And I'm a school psychologist by training, and I spent a number of years in the field doing psych evals, and I saw this very troubling trend. And it was a child who would come and be diagnosed with, say, a learning disability. Um, and then three years later, that child would have a learning disability plus an emotional or behavioral issue at hand. And, and I could list all the recommendations I wanted to that may have helped that child if, if learning could have been personalized to them to bring forth their strengths. But the fact is schools weren't designed that way, um, aren't designed. that they, They're in the process of change from what we know is an industrial model to one that better meets the needs of students. Because what was heartbreaking was that they ended up feeling like they were the problem. They felt like they were deficient. Um, and then I knew that lived with them f for the course of their education, but often the course of their lives. The other issue we're trying to address very directly is the number of students who then, who after graduating, then go on to pursue post-secondary education. It's a relatively a low percentage here in Vermont. We don't send students on to post-secondary experiences at the, at the rate we should and we need to uh, in terms of Vermont's continuing uh, economic success in the future. Anybody who's been in education for very long has had the experience of working with kids who don't want to be where they are. They don't consider the education to be relevant to them. They're not invested in it and they would pretty much rather be anywhere else this side of a dentist chair. The flexible pathways, personal learning plans, I see as a systemic way of improving the, re the perceived relevance of education to the students. And that has to improve the engagement. In the earlier days, uh, our high schools were not yet ready to move toward proficiency, even though in rule they had the opportunity to do that. It was still very much a traditional seat time based 
course-based approach. Those conversations through the years kept coming up and, and we kept seeing some, some common themes come out of that, including personalized learning. Um, in 2009, the State Board commissioned uh, a group of educators across the state and, and parents and business leaders uh, to take a more in-depth look at that. And they set some timelines and some implementation points that included um, let's look at personalized learning plans for all students. Um, again, the, the issue of dual enrollment and early college experiences came up. And, and out of that personalized learning conversation, it, it, was, it was discussed and, and determined and decided that you couldn't have a truly personalized student-centered learning experience without bringing in the role of proficiency and eliminating the use of time as the only measure that students were ready to progress through their, their public education and, and then exit their public education to college or career. When we look at the research on dropout prevention, what we see are two two qualities that really just keep jumping out again and again as important qualities that help students stay in school and persist and persevere. And the first is, is having a very strong personal relationship with an adult who's really invested in them, their learning, helping them achieve their goals, and uh, quite frankly, who is there to lend them a little bit of grit and a little bit of stamina when the going gets rough, as it always does in high school. And the other that really jumps out to us is active learning, that we know that many of our students are they, they love active learning. They like to be engaged in hands-on or community-based projects where they really see the connection between what they're learning in school and how it might apply or be useful in the kinds of real-world problems or situations that our students might see them in. Act 77 Flexible Pathways and, and some very key elements there that said, um, number one, public education funds can be spent uh, for post-secondary experiences for secondary ed students. And that was, that was quite a discussion in the state, um, very fruitful, very engaging conversation about for the first time saying you can use public education funds uh, for, for post-secondary experiences. So one of the things that I, or actually two of the things I see so promising about what we're doing in Vermont with respect to personalization of learning, um, personalized learning plans, um, and some of the performance assessment work that really is challenging us to, to do some of our learning in an applied context and then step back and from that identify what it is our students know and can do, is that it's really supporting some of the changes that are taking place and that we hope will take place in the classroom, but doing it in ways that are consistent with what we've seen in the dropout prevention literature about what catches students, helps them feel that their learning is valuable, and helps them feel that there are adults around them who know them well, know what their interests are, and are invested in their success. Um, and, and then the final thing we said in that was um, that all students beginning in November of, of 2015. All students in seventh grade and ninth grade and each grade after that uh, will have a personal learning plan. Uh, so that was a landmark piece of legislation that, that really set the stage. The, the proficiency based um, elements of that came out in 2014 passed in state board rules that said taking all of the flexible pathways in legislation and adding to that that time is no longer the, the measure of a student's readiness. That students, um, this year's seventh grade students must graduate having demonstrated and, and provided evidence of learning aligned to the state board standards. It was all credit based. So many credits and this and that and the credits didn't mean anything except you'd passed a class. There was no guaranteeing of learning. So our hope is that we can really make it a better measure of a student's learning through proficiencies instead of just passing a class. And a 65 or a 60 doesn't mean that learning's happened. Yeah. A seat time Carnegie unit based approach to progression and graduation decisions is no longer allowed as of this year's seventh graders graduating class of 2020. Those decisions for those students must be based on demonstrated proficiency against the standards. So we're very pleased that the legislature and the State Board of Education um, has enabled us to move in that direction and we believe uh, that that will have the effect um, in the context of dropout prevention of having many fewer students entering that pipeline that might in fact lead to dropping out. Uh, and we believe that if that does happen, we have a sound program in place to respond to that.
we know that what we need to be committed to doing is building these complex 21st century skills. We know that our students can figure out anything in 15 seconds if it's a fact. What we need to be able to help them do is the kind of work that isn't easily done by a, com a computer, which is you know, exercise judgment, um, reason from evidence, take an ill-structured situation where maybe the particular problem isn't even clear, so you need to figure out what it is you're trying to figure out even before you try to solve it. That's the human work that's powerful and important and that really can't be done by technology at this point. And that's what we need to be preparing our students to do because that's the only work that will be well rewarded in the economy in the future. And it's frankly also the same skill set which um, lets our, um, our students participate in vital ways in their, in their community lives, in their small towns, and in their local governments. So we know that that has to be the priority and we want to make sure we develop those skills. If you're clear about what you're trying to say, you may need to adjust the words you use if you're talking to students versus their parents, but you want to make sure that you're not communicating 17 different things to different constituencies, right? It's not about spin or what they want to hear, it's about what do we believe, what are we aiming for, how do we help different audiences understand that. Training is providing us with the opportunity to come up with a consistent message and a consistent approach that we will be able to use and that the superintendent will be able to use to generate a common sense of direction that all the schools can subscribe to because it is, that isn't a given that schools are going to be moving in the same direction because each school does have its own school board. We went to Great Schools Partnership and said, here's, here's the roadmap under this, under this five-year plan for the, that the Gates grant um, was, was funded, and said, what if we accelerated that for Vermont? We, we have an environment of readiness. We have a policy foundation that is, is quite strong, uh, as strong as any in the country, if not, um, if not stronger. And we thought we had an opportunity, being a small state, to say, this is our incubator, it's, it's a small community, and, um, well, it wouldn't be easy. We think that we've got momentum and interest and a readiness uh, for people to move forward faster than uh, the five-year plan. And great schools worked with us and created what this roadmap would look like uh, over a, a two-year period to take that first shot at how do we support schools in thinking more deeply about what does proficiency-based learning mean in, in schools? What do your grading systems look like? What do your assessments look like? Your, your local teacher-based, classroom-based assessments. How can you, how can you moderate and, and, and calibrate those assessments so you can, you can get some measure across um, schools in a district and grade levels? There were a number of those challenges for us that um, clearly showed us that this was huge. This, this was going to uh, take a number of years to, uh, to work through. But that didn't, uh, that didn't cause anyone to say we didn't want to do this. Um, so it's, it's quite an adventure. There's been a group of five or six of us that have actually been going and working with the state of Vermont around, um, you know, how do we more formally implement. And so we have, I will say right now, we have an action plan to uh, first put a little bit, I guess, to uh, advertise it a little bit because the only students that kind of know are either the ones that are really in trouble or my ninth grade students, <laughs> you know, so, but others have heard of it. So, I mean, they're, you know, they're kind of, oh, well, what is that? You know, why, why, what, when we call it pathways, you know, kind of uh, pathways, these kind of opportunities. So, I mean, I think um, over the summer, our work is to really build structure around it. It sort of, it sort of happens. Um, <laughs> that's actually a big topic today is the communication piece um, because I think we all can be better at communication um, it, and this is this is something that's tricky to communicate um, in, to our community particularly as, as um, many of our parents and, and, and families are very used to um, traditional education models uh, you know your, your, your A's, your B's, um, your honor rolls, your, your class rank um, those are tough things to begin to, to, to move away from uh, the, the importance is, is bringing people in to, to discuss the why, what's changing, what's different in our world, what's different in the world of our kids who, even though they live in a very you know, uh, rural and agricultural community, the world around them is still changing and um, they need to be prepared to, to um, work with that. It's not going to be nearly enough to merely communicate with parents. We're going to have to engage them in a, a, a authentic dialogue and involve them in the decision-making process on how details are going to be implemented. 
So we don't know how we're going to do that yet. It's certainly very clear to us that if this is going to be successful, that is going to have to be done. And so we're going to be doing some work around some of the tools that we've gotten today and over the course of the year. It's, it's very complex. This is transformative change that is being envisioned in the course of uh, implementing proficiency-based learning and the corollary of being proficiency-based graduation. We talk about transformation a lot in education. Very seldom does it actually happen. We've been talking about transformation in schools since at least the 90s, probably before that. So we started this about a year ago with thanks to the AOE with a grant that they provided us to give us time on Saturdays and weekends and even holidays. I have very dedicated staff. And we came together and um, developed a personal learning plan um, and then the flexible pathways determining. We turned the schedule that used to be sixth grade, seventh grade, ninth grade goes to math and ninth grade goes to language arts and so on. And we dumped the schedule upside down, turned it inside out, made it cross-curricular made it 9 through 12 instead of, you know, just basic grades, mixed up the students, made the class sizes a little larger, um, offered more. Uh, students told us, National Honor Society, student council, students met with us, talked about what they wanted changed. So there was a lot of student voice in it. And then from that, we made changes to the schedule. This year we offered welding and uh, we ordered metal, offered metal fabrication, Google Apps, um, culinary arts has been real popular, textile arts, um, as well as contemporary adult literature. Children's literature was really popular this year. So as well as all the other good physics and chemistry and all that good stuff. It used to be like every kid did the same exact thing. It's like there was no variation between students. But now with the personal learning plan, if a kid wants to go farther in one direction on one of the topics we do, they can, they still have to do like the, the general, sort yeah, of like, like the common core standard, but they get, they can do like certain projects that branch off on what they're interested in. And if some are like falling behind a little, they can, they get stuff that helps them get back caught up. So. Well, um, I came to Rochester in seventh grade and we didn't have any PLPs at that time, but Last, this year, beginning of this year, and I heard a little bit about last year, but beginning of my 10th grade year, they told us we would be starting them, and they gave us, they gave us a list of teachers to choose from mentors, and they, um, they help, it really helps to be at the school for this kind of program, because each teacher knows you really well, and so immediately my teacher was like, well, you really like sports, so let's try to incorporate like what you like into learning what, what is important to get on your transcripts and everything, so he's helping me with what I like to incorporate it into um, all my studies, which is awesome. For one, because we're such a small school and our classes are really small, um, students have a really good opportunity to have some one-on-one -on -one time with a teacher, and the teacher is usually more than willing to stay after school or come in a little earlier in the mornings to stay, spend more time with the student to uh, get them all caught up if they're not understanding a concept or whatever. Each teacher also has for the personal learning plan, each teacher has a group of kids that if in like their specific interest <coughs> that they go to them and stuff and that teacher like um, adjusts the curriculum for them. Last summer when we went to some workshops and decided to implement the personal learning plans, we were really just formalizing what we already had done. So what we did was we set up a program where we filled out some questionnaires and some surveys. We matched the students up with advisors and we try to guide them to make more choices. I like to say I look at it as you're the student's cheerleader and you know, try to encourage them to try new things. My um, teacher, my mentor, he, he, what he's really doing is pushing me to take more online classes during the summer and to, do think, to get all of these like, subjects that I'm interested in that aren't taught here. And since I already have a full schedule here to try to you know, put them into other places like over the summer where I have a lot of time to do the classes and I'm, I'm all for it and he's helping me find the curriculums online and help me find the places where I can take the classes and helping me set them up so he's been suggesting things throughout the school year and I've been trying to explore them and pick ones that I'm interested in so. They want to be here because they can choose what it is. 
we worked hard with um, we're doing developmental assets and reaching the, stu the students spark you know what is it that makes them get up and come to school just like what is it that makes us as adults get up and go to work and so we really tried to focus in on that and um, constantly saying well how does this work with students and because the leadership team works so hard on well is that what's really best for kids um, it's easy to stay on track and to be able to do the new innovative programs that we've done this year. The board's very supportive of it. It's, uh, it's engaging the children more, I think, than when I went to school. Um, in this community, um, we're kind of addressing their, their excitement about learning and, and bringing it together with the three R's, which we had back in the day. Um, it, it's bringing them back, it's bringing them more engaged, I believe. Than, than ever before. They've given me as much challenge as they can here, and they know that um, I like striving high, or striving really far, so um, they can see that I need that extra challenge, so they haven't been trying to hold me back. I actually want to go pre-med when I go to college in two years. I'm actually starting my freshman year next year through the early college program. Um, I got into VAST for next year. Uh, I got a lot of support from my history teacher, actually, and all the teachers have been really supportive of my decision to take my education to a little bit of a higher notch or higher level. Um, well, it's really nice to, there's a lot of teachers that help you out and you can pick a lot of things. They'll ask you, what do you want to learn about? Do you want to learn about this or this? So I think that's nice. Um, and there's a lot of new things that are offered this year. So like band and chorus and there's a sustainability class, which is really fun. And it gets, it's like hands on gardening and we clean the cafeteria. So. Yeah, we have a plan that we have a sheet that is actually we had to fill out before. And it's just what our interests are, what our strong suits are. Like I like math and science. And it's just some other people, some people might like English and literature or history. It depends on the student and your interests and what you want to do in your future. It's n nothing set in stone, but w an idea. And they try to guide you into classes that will help you. The students have helped build our schedule through their enthusiasm based on, well, if you can do this, well, then why can't we do this? So next year we're hoping to do some robotics and a couple of STEM classes um, because the students want to integrate doing some of the courses that they've done this year. And actually, there's a science fiction and a science emerging tech joint class. It's just trying to make life re make learning real, which it hasn't always been. It's just been out of books, and now it's real. And then they leave here, and they go home, and they talk about it to their parents. And that's one of the exciting things is the parents go, I really like that compost bin you all just built. And sometimes even I don't know that the compost bin was built, but I know they're doing it, but I don't know it was done that day. So it works out well. I've taught Harrison since he was in middle school. I knew he had an interest in alternative energy. I knew he wanted to go to college for that. And so we looked around and said, you know, I think this is something a lot of other kids will be interested in too. And that was one of the impetuses in creating the course. So. Mm -hmm. So we really try to look at what the students want and then design what we do around that. Um, when I arrived here, there was a student who should have graduated. He's bright, brilliant, and um, the administrator prior to me didn't. They didn't have personalized learning, <clears throat> and they didn't have flexible pathways. And um, he didn't make it. And had he had that, I think he would have made it because instead of making him sit in a class seven hours, seven hours a day, you know, and you will do this and you will read this book and you will do this, I think, and what happens with many students is they'll act out. You know, if they're bored or if they don't understand, they're going to do that because that's what they want to do is be out of class. And this particular student didn't make it. And, you know, it was my first year here. But it broke my heart because I just feel like every day that the subs are here, whoever it is, we're responsible for those kids. That's, that's a day in their life and that's a valuable commodity. And so making those days count 
is paramount. That's why we show up. That's why we're here. This all started with the State of Vermont's initiative on uh, thinking about flexible pathways for students, which I jumped on board 10 years ago, you know, before it was even coming on, understanding that students perhaps were, had a lot more potential than we allow them in the structure of the kind of lessons that we, you know, necessarily provide. The first year we were, um, recipients thankfully of a grant and we started to develop this idea of having pathways for individual students. Did that for a year and what I noticed I was working with the students that were most seemed most at risk. So it's just the way it wasn't planned that way but it just organically ended up being that way. I think early on especially did very well with grabbing students that um, didn't like traditional models but we wanted to expand it to students who were going to be successful in the traditional model, but would, would benefit from those. So we really tried to make it cover the whole spectrum of students. So our first jump into all of that was really with a small group of kids who were pretty either disenfranchised with schools and demonstrating the patterns that we would see that would lead to dropping out, or they had recently dropped out. Uh, and we actively went out and sought them out and said, hey, what if we designed something that met your learning style? And uh, we got enough takers to, uh, to make that work. Really what it distills down to is it's an opportunity for all the stakeholders, the teachers, the students, the parents, the community, to reconnect with the learning. Um, traditional systems don't always do that. So with measuring students against particular performance-based indicators, we're able to tell for the first time specifically what they're learning and what they're not learning and can be more prescriptive about the teaching process. Well, the biggest problem I have had through high school was my grammar and how I write essays or how I talk to my class. I get a little shaky. I get nervous. <laughs> but now, taking that pilot class, I, I know how to do slideshows. I know how to do presentations. I don't read from a book. I just talk to the class with all being very excited and being very happy. I don't, I don't read from papers. I just, I look at the slide and I'm like, yeah, I know what I'm going to talk about. And I just, I will go on for like 15 minutes. And I think that has been my greatest problem and my greatest success in high school is now I can do that 25 minute presentation, I can do that 30 minute presentation. I think that around the ninth grade is when kids begin to formulate those kinds of things and so um, what we've done is, as a system is focus on ninth grade as that place where kids are going to do some self-inventory, do a lot of reflection, reading and writing around that kind of stuff, explore some areas without any risk, because um, a lot of times kids are curious about things, but maybe that's not the road they want to get down, or try something and realize that wasn't what I thought it was going to be, and so they go on to something else. We stayed with consistent curriculum of a ninth grade curriculum, social studies, language arts, but embedded each quarter, they had an opportunity to explore whatever. I, I gave no limits. We learned so much. We learned from each other. Um, one of our classmates taught our class uh, poetry. I went for photography. Um, Brianna did criminal justice. We had someone try sending soccer balls overseas for the child soldiers. We had so much opportunity to learn about so many things. It was really fun. Um, in that class, it was more of like an individual approach. So we were like independent. Like we each got to pick like what we wanted to do. I went to a homeless shelter actually and um, interviewed a couple different homeless shelters so I could compare them and then show that to the class. And 
I ended up raising $180 for a homeless shelter and we're still planning on taking um, people from her pilot class this year and going down and like involving them in one of my projects and like cooking a dinner for them with the money that I made for them. They learned a lot from each other, yes. No, I, absolutely. I mean, I think, um, you know, when it, the complexity of what it means to design a video game. So like they, when he presented, people were like blown away, like, wow, you know, we thought you were just playing in front of them. And then he was showing the step by step. So then rec recognizing that that's uh, more complex, kids, the students would also feed off each other. So, you know, in, in a project, one might have an idea and say, well, you know, I, I'd like to do something here. And so that, yeah, I mean, they, they totally learn from each other. They're very appreciative and so respectful of each other's work at their presentations. It, it was, um, you know, better than an adult audience sometimes because they knew um, the process. It's, it's very complex. This is transformative change that is being envisioned in the course of uh, implementing proficiency-based learning. Um, we believe that these policies that we have in place now, now will help us uh, accomplish those goals of graduating more students and preparing more stu graduates to be able to go on to post-secondary experiences and uh, to be ready for the job market either immediately or after some continued training.